You ever notice that if you get to know two identical twins, they might look alike, but they're always subtly different? Yeah, whatever. As they get older, those differences can get more pronounced. Two people start out the same, but their appearance and their health can diverge. For instance, you have more gray hair. No, no, I don't. Identical twins have the same DNA, the exact same genes. Yeah. And don't our genes make us who we are? Well, they do, yes, but they're not the whole story. Some researchers have discovered a new bit of biology that can work with our genes or against them. Yeah. You're heavier and I'm better looking. Yeah. Whatever. Imagine coming into the world with a person so like yourself that for a time you don't understand mirrors. As a child, when I looked in the mirror, I'd say, that's my sister. And my mother would say, no, that's your reflection. And even if you resist this cookie-cutter existence, cultivate individual styles and abilities, like cutting your hair differently or running faster. Uncanny similarities bond you together. Facial expressions body language, the way you laugh, or dress for an interview perhaps, when you hadn't a clue what your sister was going to wear. The synchrony in your lives constantly confronts you. When I see my sister, I see myself. If she looks good, I think I look pretty today. But if she's not wearing makeup, I say, my God, I look horrible. It's hardly surprising, because you both come from the same egg. You have precisely the same genes. And you're literally clones, better known as identical twins. But now, imagine this. One day, your twin, your clone, is diagnosed with cancer. If you're the other twin, what can you do except wait for the symptoms? I have been told that I am a high risk for cancer. Damocles' sword hangs over me. And yet, it's not uncommon for a twin like Anna Marie to get a dread disease, while the other, like Clotilde, doesn't. But how can two people so alike be so unalike? Well, these mice may hold a clue. Their DNA is as identical as Anna Marie and Clotilde's, despite the differences in their color and size. The human who studies them is Duke University's Randy Jurdle. So Randy, I see here you have skinny mice and fat mice. What have you done in this lab? Well, these animals are actually genetically identical. The fat ones and the skinny ones? That's correct. Because these are huge. They're huge. Uh, can we weigh them to find sure. out? So if you take, this is... Looks I'm like not, they can barely walk. They, they didn't, can't walk too much. They're not going to be running very far. So that's so about 63 grams. 63 grams. Let's look at the other one. So it's half the weight. Right. This gets even more mysterious when you realize that these identical mice both have a particular gene called agouti. But in the yellow mouse, it stays on all the time, causing obesity. <laughs> Just look at this. So what accounts for the thin mouse? Exercise? Atkins? No. A tiny chemical tag of carbon and hydrogen called a methyl group has affixed to the agouti gene, shutting it down. Living creatures possess millions of tags like these. Some, like methyl groups, attach to genes directly, inhibiting their function. Other types grab the proteins, called histones, around which genes coil, and tighten or loosen them to control gene expression. Distinct methylation and histone patterns exist in every cell, constituting a sort of second genome the epigenome. 
Epigenetics literally translates into just meaning above the genome. So if you would think, for example, of the genome as being like a computer, the hardware of, the, of, of a computer, the epigenome would be like the software that tells the computer when to work, how to work, and how much. In fact, it's the epigenome that tells our cells what sort of cells they should be. Skin, hair, heart. You see, all these cells have the same genes, but their epigenomes silence the unneeded ones to make cells different from one another. Epigenetic instructions pass on as cells divide, but they're not necessarily permanent. Researchers think they can change, especially during critical periods like puberty or pregnancy. Schertl's mice reveal how the epigenome can be altered. To produce thin brown mice instead of fat yellow ones, he feeds pregnant mothers a diet rich in methyl groups to form the tags that can turn genes off. And I think you can see that we dramatically shifted the coat color and we get many, many more brown animals. And that matters because your coat color is a tracer. It's, it's an indicator. That's correct. Of the, the fact that you have turned off that gene. That's right. This epigenetic fix was also inherited by the next generation of mice, regardless of what their mothers ate. And when an environmental toxin was added to the diet instead of nutrients, more yellow babies were born doomed to grow fat and sick like their mothers. It seems to me this has profound implications for our health. It does. For human health, if there are genes like this in humans, basically what you eat can affect your future generations. So you're not only what you eat, potentially what your mother ate, and possibly even what your grandparents ate. So how do you go to humans to do this experiment when you have these mice and they're genetically identical on purpose. That's so right. So who is your perfect lab human? Well, then we look for identical humans, which are identical twins. 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 And that brings us to the reason why we're showing you Spanish twins. In 2005, they participated in a groundbreaking study in Madrid. Its aim? To show just how identical epigenetically they are or aren't. One of the questions of twins is that if my twin has this disease, I will have the same disease. And genetics uh, tell us that there is a high risk of developing the same disease, but it's not really uh, sure they're going to have it, because our genes are just part of the story. Something has to regulate these genes, and part of the explanation is epigenetics. Esteller wanted to see if the twins' epigenomes might account for their differences. To find out, he and his team collected cells from 40 pairs of identical twins, age 3 to 74. Then began the laborious process of dissolving the cells until all that was left were wispy strands of DNA, the master molecule that contains our genes. Next, researchers amplified fragments of the DNA until the genes themselves became detectable. Those that had been turned off epigenetically appear as dark pink bands on the gel. Now, notice what happens when the genes from a pair of twins are cut out and overlapped. The results are far from subtle especially when you compare the epigenomes of two sets of twins that differ in age. Here on the left is the overlapped DNA of six-year-old Javier and Carlos. The yellow indicates where their gene expression is identical. On the right is the DNA of 66-year-old Ana Marie and Clotilde. In contrast to the younger twins, hardly any yellow shines through. Their epigenomes have changed dramatically. The study suggests that as twins age, epigenetic differences accumulate, especially when their lifestyles differ. One of the main findings of our research 
is that epigenomes can change in function of what we eat, of what we smoke, of what we drink. And this is one of the key uh, differences between epigenetics and genetics. You know? You know? As the chemical tags that control our genes change, cells can become abnormal, triggering diseases like cancer. Take a disorder like MDS, cancer of the blood and bone marrow. It's not a diagnosis you'd ever want to hear. When I went in, then he started patting my hand and he was going, your blood work does not look very good at all and that I had um, MDS leukemia and uh, that there was not a cure for it. And basically I had six months uh, to live. Was epigenetics the reason? Could the silencing of critical genes turn normal cells into cancerous ones? It's scary to think that a few misplaced tags can kill you. But it's also good news, because we've traditionally viewed cancer as a disease stemming solely from broken genes. And it's a lot harder to fix damaged genes than to rearrange epigenetic tags. In fact, we already have a few drugs that will work. Recently, Sandra Shelby and Roy Cantwell participated in one of the first clinical trials using epigenetic therapy. The idea of epigenetic therapy is to stay away from killing the cell. Rather, what we are trying to do is diplomacy, trying to change the instructions of the cancer cells, reminding the cell hey, you're a human cell, you shouldn't be behaving this way. And we try to do that by reactivating genes. The results have been incredible. And I didn't have really any horrible side effects. I am in remission. And going in the plus direction is a whole lot better than the minus direction. In fact, half the patients in the trial are now in remission. But while it may be easier to fix our epigenome than our genome, messing it up is easier too. We've got to get people thinking more about what they do. They have a responsibility for their epigenome. Their genome they inherit, but their epigenome they potentially can alter, and particularly that of their children. And that brings in responsibility, but it also brings in hope. You're not necessarily stuck with this, you can alter this.